Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Steves, and it's my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanities Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to a very special evening, as tonight we present the annual Humanities Laureate Award to a very special and deserving group of people. We first begin, as we always begin at the Humanities Center, by acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather this evening, the actual soil beneath our feet. Long before Europeans arrived, varied and numerous native people sought to walk gently on this land. They offered assistance to the first European travelers to this territory, sharing their knowledge for survival and living a good life. Among others, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Miami, and Illinois inhabited what is now this part of Chicago. While we here today have no power to honor the treaties that were signed, we do recognize that these treaties were brokered under some duress and deception. So it's our hope tonight to honor the good faith with which the native people of the region entered into these treaties. As Potawatomi Chief Matea is purported to have said at the signing of the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, this is a small piece of land, and if we give it away, what will become of us? The great spirit who has provided it for our use allows us to keep it. We should incur his anger if we bartered it away. If we had more land, you should get more. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors, and we now have hardly enough left to cover the bones of our tribe. In solidarity with Chief Matea, we recognize the history and legacy of this subjugation, as well as the enduring presence today of Native Americans among our faculty, staff, student body, and community. And it's thus that we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on honor and true respect. Now I say these words and try to stand up for their meaning before each event we host, but tonight they have special importance because it's precisely the fact that the United States government and capitalist industry, as if there really were a difference between the two, have acted with anything but honor and respect in the way in which the Dakota Access Pipeline was undertaken and the people it would impact were treated. I'll have more words to say by way of introduction and I'll introduce our guests in a few moments as well. But we thought it might be good to start off the evening with some compiled video and film clips of the struggle that's been taking place at Standing Rock for several months. Some inspirational, made by allies, some more troubling, made by corporate media, but just a way perhaps to bring us all up to speed. So I'll see you again in about 15 minutes. Welcome, everyone. So I'd like to take a moment before we get started in earnest to thank publicly Margaret Potts. Margaret was my student here at DePaul a few years ago and it was clear that she had the heart and the mind to go on to do important things. A couple of years ago she was teaching in the Pine Ridge area of North Dakota, already committing herself to indigenous social justice issues such as fighting environmental racism. When she became involved in the anti-pipeline movement, co-founding the People Over Pipelines organization, and you could see some of their banners in some of the video we just watched. And I wanted to thank Margaret for her work, for her help in making this evening possible, and for being the sort of alumna who's a model for us all. So if you're here, Margaret, could you stand up just a second? And thank you very much. So, Water is a strange thing. The oxygen and hydrogen atoms in a water molecule are not arranged in a straight line, they're bent. The molecule is polar as a result. The pair of electrons that the hydrogen and oxygen are sharing in their covalent bond is shifted toward the oxygen atom. The oxygen end is thus slightly negative, the hydrogen slightly positive. Two polar molecules easily bond to each other with a hydrogen bond, then but this weak bond breaks easily. This gives water its flexible, fluid nature. It flows, it takes any shape, breaking and then recombining along these bonds to remain one thing while also adapting to everything that's around it. Water is life. The Earth's surface is more than 70% water, and all life on Earth, not just human life, requires water. Because of this, our model for life in general is hydrocentric. I've been fortunate to spend a fair amount of time at NASA over the last decade, 
And in astrobiology, the catchphrase has always been, follow the water. If there's hope of finding life on another planet, it begins first by seeking a planet that has liquid water on it. It's possible that other forms of life might not need water, but because water is so friendly to life's arising and maintaining its presence on a planet, the NASA model is always to search for water first. Water is so hospitable to life for a variety of reasons. It's almost a perfect solvent. Most hydride molecules, ammonia and methane for instance, are not liquids under average conditions. At room temperature and pressure, only oxygen hydride, that is H2O, is a liquid and not a gas. Water was the perfect and necessary first ingredient in the primordial soup that gave birth to life on Earth nearly four billion years ago. We all come from the water. Some of my NASA friends even believe that the little water bubbles in frothing sea foam acted as the first proto-cells in closed spaces in which loose organic materials floating in the ocean could combine to create the peptides that would be the building blocks of life billions of years ago. And once life began, water helped to make sure it would continue. Water is capable of taking in enormous amounts of heat without similar increases in temperature. And thus, massive oceans on Earth absorb and redistribute energy from the sun all across the planet, making a uniform and predictably stable set of conditions for evolution to do its work. In colder climes, water-based life is able to survive harsh winters precisely because of the strangeness of water. Most liquids tend to get dense and shrink when they're frozen into a solid, but not water. It expands and floats which means that it rises to the top of freshwater deposits and ponds and lakes, forms a cap on the surface to seal in the heat below, and it allows life floating beneath to brave the winter. We exist, all of this around us exists, because of the peculiarities of the physics and chemistry of water. After spending nine months in its mother's body inside a water-filled sack, the human baby bursts into a world needing a drink, Breast milk is 88% water. Our blood's plasma is more than 90% water. As a whole, a human adult is two-thirds water, more than 13 gallons. Nerve impulses work because of water's chemical structure. And because water is such a magnificent solvent, it is the perfect medium to carry nutrients all throughout the body, delivering food and oxygen to the brain, to the heart, down to the tips of our toes. Lack of water is death. If you lose 2% of your body weight's worth of water, which would be like running for an hour without hydrating, your blood becomes thick and sluggish, your temperature increases and your heart rate goes up, you'll soon be sick unless you drink some water. Lose 4% of your body weight without drinking, like taking a bike ride in the summer for three hours straight without hydrating, and your blood pressure drops, you begin fainting, you stop sweating, and you start to overheat. Without water, you'll soon end up in the hospital. At 7% water loss, which is like doing hot yoga for eight hours, your blood pressure drops so low that your body goes into crisis mode. It shuts down blood flow to secondary organs such as your kidneys and all throughout your gut in order to protect the brain. But this is only a temporary stopgap measure as waste starts to build up at a cellular level and the body begins to die. At 10% loss, what it's like to go without water for five days, death is inevitable. The liver overheats first, followed by the kidneys. A toxic sludge accumulates in the blood until it no longer flows. The story is over. Without water, the story is always over. Like humans, every animal we know of operates on water, as does every plant. Because water has extremely high surface tension, magnificently tall trees can create sap that will rise up hundreds of feet through mere capillary action. That's the beauty of the science of water. It ties us all together and it keeps us functioning. And so every living thing must take in water to live, but the food we eat also requires water. And what we eat, what we choose to water in order to eat, is a political decision. To produce 100 calories of beef requires a mass of 1,000 liters of water. 100 calories of wheat, only 55 liters. And 100 calories of broccoli, merely 10. Water is, 
at every step of its life and our life political. Generally, we have not been politically wise or just in our treatment of water and those it nourishes, as we have not been just in our treatment of the most marginalized in our community. Today, it's true that Native Americans have the highest poverty and unemployment rate in the country. Nearly one in three Native Americans lives below the poverty line, that's a double the nation's average, and 8% of Native American homes do not have access to clean water. Some of this is due to old, well-established patterns of racism. Some of it's also due to modern environmental racism, pitting the interests of Native communities against companies insistent on treating the world as a natural resource, as a commodity. Fracking, for instance, pumps 100 billion gallons of fluid into the U.S. water table each year. A slurry meant to crack shale, release oil, and natural gas, that sometimes makes local communities have hot and cold running fire coming out of their tap. And because the U.S. government and capitalist industry are two heads of the same beast, laws of imminent domain in which property can be used and seized against the will of those who own it or inhabit it have come to be applied to cases not only where the common good of the nation is at stake, but the common good of a corporation. I could go on, but I won't. And I won't for a very important reason. I hope that we'll have a chance to talk in just a few moments about, among other things, various parts of the video we've just seen. The fact that the CNN reporter gets hung up on how much the protests at Standing Rock have cost taxpayers in terms of paying law enforcement to police and commit acts of violence against those in the camps always makes me laugh and cry at the same time. Yes, the pipeline is moving forward. Yes, it's already had a leak. But as I see it, Standing Rock stands as a success. As I see it, the thousands and thousands of people who stood up for what is right did not do so in vain. That is, we can talk about oppression, and we can certainly talk about the sad history of how things came to be this way. But I hope that tonight we can also see that what was accomplished at Cannonball will send reverberations throughout history. This gathering of Native Americans, the largest in modern history, perhaps the largest ever, has changed the game. It will, I think, change the way in which we think about environmental issues, about resistance, about what it means to be an activist. And if we keep working at it and keep the sacred stone camp alive, even after it's disbanded, it might even change the way our democracy functions. We are here, that is, to learn, talk, and think together. But we're also here to celebrate together. And so, it's my honor to bring to the stage our three special guests. Bobby Jean Three Legs, one of the founders of Respect Our Water, identifies herself as one of the survivors of the Hunkpapa Lakota people who are now located on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. She's an organizer, a visionary, a role model, not only for young people, but for everyone seeking to live a life of meaning and conscience. One of the first to take up residence at the Sacred Stone Camp, along with her brother, Joseph White Eyes, Bobby Jean organized and participated in a 2,000-mile relay run from North Dakota to Washington, D.C. that was instrumental in drawing national attention to the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle. We're so pleased she can be with us this evening. Friends, this is Bobby Jean Three Legs. Dallas Goldtooth is the Keep It In The Ground campaign organizer for the Indigenous Environmental Network. He co-founded the indigenous comedy group, the 1491s, and is a Dakota culture and language teacher. He's also a poet, traditional artist, powwow MC, and comedian. He's been an important voice at Standing Rock, and his work, especially in drawing attention to the police violence during the struggle, caused countless people to take notice and get involved. Apart from such serious things, then, I might add that if you have not seen such skits as The Indian Show, which he has up on YouTube, you need to watch them immediately following our time together tonight, as you are unlikely to see such creative and funny cultural commentary anywhere else. Dallas is as hilarious as he is committed to the cause. Please join me in welcoming Dallas Goldtooth. <laughs> Finally, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard's many accomplishments and positions would take far too long to enumerate. With degrees from the University of North Dakota in history and Indian studies, LaDonna went on to be a key member of her community, 
working with groups for tourism and historic preservation since the 1990s. One would be hard pressed to find another person so committed to the history and future of her people and land and with such apparently limitless energy and talent as well. Even before the Dakota Access Pipeline, visitors to Standing Rock, which numbered in the tens of thousands over the last couple of decades, were likely to meet LaDonna as she regularly offered historic tours to, of the area to international groups. Just over a year ago, she founded Sacred Stone Camp on her own property. It was the first resistance camp for Dakota Access Pipeline protesters, and it's an honor to have her joining us today. Please join me in welcoming LaDonna Bravebull. The DePaul Humanities Center is pleased tonight to present its annual Humanities Laureate Award to the Water Protectors at Standing Rock. I'm delighted, in fact, that this is our first year that the award is bestowed not on a single person, but on a group of people. A group that has come together, made history, transcended the boundaries of race, sex, gender, and ethnicity, and brought together not only the more than 10,000 individuals of that collective, but, indeed, the world. Tonight, we're honored, honored to have these three activists and water protectors here to accept on their behalf. Though the official title of the award is the Humanities Laureate Award, here at the Humanities Center, we have taken to thinking of the award in its shorthand, using a term coined several years ago by my colleague, Sean Kirkland. We call it the Humanaut. Like a cosmonaut who explores the cosmos, the humanaut is someone who has explored the outer reaches of and hurled him or herself into the yawning abyss of what it means to be a human being, modeling what a human ought to be and what the arts and humanities might aspire to become. I can think of no better way to explain the courage and skills that have led that community's members to put their bodies on the line for what they believe. And it's thus in recognition of the ethical, political, and cultural importance of this community's ongoing struggle and in celebration of the role that the arts and humanities play in establishing such a strong and important culture and people that we celebrate together with this award tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating these representatives to the DePaul Humanities Center's 2016 Humanities Laureate Award, the Water Protectors at Standing Rock. Turn it on, please, and speak into it uh, nice and close to your mouth so we can get this recorded and everybody can hear. And I'll just say publicly what I told our, our three special guests tonight, and that is that for the, the next hour or so, what we want to do is to have a real conversation about some of these ideas and notions. Not an interview, not something so formal, but something more organic. So I've encouraged everybody to ask questions of each other, uh, and just to let things unfold as they might unfold among friends. And then for the last few minutes, we'd like to bring you in as well. So we'll put a microphone there in the audience and ask you to be a part as well. So, given that it should be organic, let me just start with one question that you may want uh, to begin by addressing, and that is, can we talk a little bit about what's gone right? Why this is worth celebrating? How it's been a success? Instead of some of the dark, sad images, like I put up there in the news recently, how do you view everything that you've been going through as something that is a real success? Um, first and foremost, I, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Um, 
But most of all, I want to thank all the people that came to Standing Rock. Without them, this wouldn't have become true. And it was really a calling to all of our hearts. And this award means, would mean so much to them. Um, I also would like to thank the youth that ran all the way out to um, Mobridge, Omaha, and DC. Without them, I wouldn't have awoken myself. And for my daughter, if it wasn't for her asking for a drink of water, I wouldn't have really joined the fight either. I not really understood how important water was. I think it's a success because it's gone throughout the whole world. And I, there were days when we were just running out on the road alone, just as just the youth. And I don't think we really thought about how um, the awareness would have been so powerful and how it went across the world. And it, I'm really grateful and thankful for that because people are understanding how important water is now. And um, they're really understanding about the fossil fuel industry and they're also learning about how and where their money is going and how it's being spent. So it's really important to um, divest in those banks that, that um, use this money to build projects like this. Thanks so much. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first, I, I just want to say again, uh, basically what Bobby says is, you know, this is an honor, but it's an honor for all of our water protectors, and I want to pay recognition, um, do recognition to the people, uh, all our relatives that came out and were in Standing Rock. And also that, not only that, but the relatives are supported from afar. You know, the, the countless thousands upon thousands of people who supported, whether financially or sent good supplies or shared this conversation about what was happening at, um, around the dinner table in their workplace, like that collectively, I think that is a, a part of this honor, this award, is that we did this together. Um, I think that the, the it's it's so easy. It's a great question to start off with, right? Because I think that's the immediate the human reaction is like, well, let's just focus on the negative. Like, oh, this is it's a failure. But no, it is not a failure. If for exactly the same things that Bobby had pointed out, is that every step of the way from the very beginning to even where we're at now, Standing Rock and the, the fight against Dakota Access Pipeline, it's changing the dialogue. It's changing the conversation about how we talk about our relationship to each other. It's changing the conversation of how we relate to indigenous peoples and, and, and recognize indigenous rights. It's changing our relationship to the banks and who we bank with and where we spend our money. It's changing the conversation about water and necessity. It's continuing this legacy in this country that we've been seeing of, of recognizing the importance of water. And you know, before the fight against Dakota Access Pipeline, and the, the most recent dialogue was Flint, Michigan, which is still an ongoing issue, is the recognition for the basic human right to water, to clean water. And so that's so much stuff that we, we, we have to celebrate. That because of, I, I attribute it because of what we did and, and we continue to do up in, uh, along the Cannonball River, that we've seen this movement of other camps all across the country. That there's fires that have been ignited all across the land, physical camp fires, and also this very spiritual fire in each and every one of us. Oh. And that is the most beautiful thing about this. And that's what I celebrate, and I'm more than happy to celebrate and acknowledge. Um, and you know, given the political climate we're in, we need that fire. And that fire is really kind of the source of our resistance. So that's, that's why my thoughts on that. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to say thank you um, for this award, but most of all, for every water protector out there. This is their award. They came with their hearts, their minds, their feet on the ground. They stood against tremendous abuse, and they stood there in prayer. They stood there in nonviolent direct action. They stood there in civil disobedience saying, we want justice. When they did that, it changed the world. When the people started coming into the camps, there was no rule, there was no leaders, there was just people helping people. 
And when I looked around the camps, the first thing I seen was this is how humanity should live. Sharing food with each other, sharing chores with each other, helping each other, praying, singing, dancing. I found great joy in the camp. I found healing in the camp. What has happened today is that joy, that healing has spread across the world. I'm so honored and blessed to be able to speak at the UN. And one of the things that happened at the Indigenous Permanent Forum was every country stood up and said, Mini Wachoni. And I was like, holy man, the whole world is speaking Lakota. <laughs> and they said they stand with Standing Rock. Is that not amazing? Do you know that there are camps going up in the Sami nation and Norway and Sweden, Mongolians and Russia and China, camps in Africa, of course our dear Aboriginals in Australia, the Maoris in New Zealand, all the European camps. Something happened greater than ourselves. So these awards go to each and every one of those people there. And we have only just begun. Puya, from the mountain in Hawaii, said, Ladana, I am worried. She said, let me take the coals from this fire and take them to Hawaii and put them in the mountain so the fire burns forever. So the sacred fire of sacred stone never goes out. So they took our fire to the mountain in Hawaii. So it burns with the earth now so it will spread across the world. I am so honored to be able to stand with the Aboriginal, I mean the people of the Amazon, all the people of Canada. There is something bigger than these camps happening today. This has only just begun. One of the things that I tell people and somewhere along the line, we forgot that the power has always been in the people. How we live should be the people's choice. And we want to have good, clean water for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and all of the future generations. It's a simple process to me. It's simple. What did we learn? That we've only just begun. What are the positives? The whole world is listening. What is happening? We are changing the world one step at a time, one prayer at a time, moving forward. How we do that is up to each individual because there is no leaders in this movement. It is everybody. There's a lot in there. And just to pick up on the, the, the very last thing you said, it seems to me that is one of the central important lessons. The idea that this is, this is very grassroots, that it's not hierarchical, it does not have a central leader. And these other camps that you mentioned around the world, it's not because they're franchises of some big institution, right? They are rising up on their own. And it seems to me that's one of the powerful messages of what's been happening for the last year at Standing Rock. And I think one of the keys too is exactly what you said, LaDonna, that the power has always been with the people. Because those in power, they don't want us to believe that. They want to set the agenda for what the debate is. And it always ends up being a battle of rights, or are you going to elect the right person who's going to take care of you, and that person will protect your rights, or maybe they won't protect your rights, who knows what they'll do tomorrow. But by changing the conversation to say that's not where the power necessarily resides, it resides in me, here, now, I think that's a major life-changing thing and a message that needs to go out, and it's just one of the beautiful things that I, I saw coming out of, of your camp. <laughs> uh, this last year. Thank you for that. I, I think that, um, that that dynamic, like it, it, we tapped into something that everyone, we've all dreamed of. You know, uh, the idea of no hierarchy, or even like a lot of like environmental organizations, 
have been fighting in, in, in legit like grassroots communities or even up to the big green environmental groups have been fighting different fights all for, for generations now. And, but what happened in Standing Rock and, and the fight against Dakota Access Pipeline even inspired them, it even, was even a change for them because it was, it was from the grassroots up, you know? And, uh, and I think what, what it was so powerful about the, 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 the messaging of me with Choni, which is really, again, it was pretty cool to hear people using indigenous language uh, even though sometimes I mispronounce it, it's okay, you're trying, it's all right. You know, people were saying mini chonies, and I was like, no, don't say mini chonies. It's not mini chonies. Um, but the, the, um, what, was, what was, was inspiring about it is that it was accessible. That's the thing, is that you, you fight, you struggle, and you work, but also, you're trying to deliver a narrative. You're trying to change the conversation. That's what we're trying to do, is change this conversation about where we get our energy from. We're trying to change the conversation about how do we relate to Mother Earth, to Uchimaka. We're trying to change the conversation about how we relate to each other. And in order to do that, we have to make it relatable. We have to really help you understand why we need to change. And just that simple phrase, water is life, is so accessible that it made millions of people wake up. I mean, millions of people say, holy crap, there's something that needs to change here. And that was something that wasn't planned for. That was organic. That was the beautiful part. That was the spirit in Unchimaka guiding us to make the right changes that we need to make. That's the beautiful part. So like that, and that's something that, that's a huge learning lesson for future work. The future of organizing work for the organizers in the room and the organizers back home is how do you make this narrative, like you, how do you package what you're doing into a story and a narrative that is relatable, that, be, that can change hearts and minds? And that's what we did and that's what we continue to do. So another interesting language question too, I think, in that the notion of being a water protector really took over in place of being a protester or an activist. And it seems to me that there's a lot of power in that as well. That's changing the conversation. How, do you know how that started, really? Um, do you feel that that has been actually an important part of, of the movement? When do you, you guys remember the first time we started really using water protector? I think it, I think it started at camps, but it all started with prayer. Um, when we did the first run, um, my Lala said a prayer for us, and he was speaking to us in Lakota. And, well, most of us youth there didn't understand what he was saying, but what he was saying to us in our language was that, do we really understand what we're about to begin? And and then he went went on to tell us about how the water has its own being, has its own spirit, and wherever we go after this, it's going to follow us, and that's exactly what it did. And my first trip out to New York with Ladonna, we got to. Um, meet up with the Hukalea voyagers from Hawaii and those guys travel around the whole world using just the sun, the stars and all the elements of, of life to travel and sail and it takes them four years and um, that really opened up my heart and my mind and um, we prayed, we prayed with all the water and I believe at that time it was the same thing the water had its own spirit, and when we offered it back with our prayers, it, it literally went out through, throughout the whole world. We had water from all the seven continents, all the seven seas. We had water that had already been damaged. We had one of the purest, freshest waters you can have. You could just drink right out of it. Um, also, this last trip that I took with LaDonna to Alaska, we were just driving on the side of the road, and we see these people filling up their five gallon tri-state um, jugs off the mountain. They're just filling their water up with fresh water. And I've never seen that in my life. And I just thought that was so beautiful that they could just go up and drink their water right off the mountain. And you know, we got to bring some of it home with us. I'm really, really thankful for that. But um, it definitely started with prayer. So, you know, um, people used to say, 
And are you a protester? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not protesting anything. We're protecting. And I think that's everybody's um, idea when they were saying, we are protecting the water. And, and I always tell people, I have never, ever been the aggressor. We've only been the defenders. We've only stood up to defend. And so we never wanted to hurt anybody. We never wanted to cause pain to anybody. We needed to protect. And I think that whole concept is how the water protector um, name came about. That, that makes sense, and it seems to fit the the model, the sort of a, almost apolitical model that you were talking about before. Of if you're a protester, then it means that someone far away has come up with some idea, and they've set the agenda. Now it's up to you to protest against that or not. So, using even the language of a protester already is to buy into that system and that ideology. And that's what's so insidious about this movement. I think that's so great about it. Another thing that strikes me that, that's different, and I don't know, tell me what, what you think about this, but there's been so much talk about how the, the water belongs to future generations, that it doesn't belong to us. And as I was ruminating on this, one of the things that struck me is that it's doing something interesting with the word belong. Because this is always a problem when I'm trying to think about environmental ethics, too. It, it always plays into already a very capitalist mentality of who has the rights, who's gonna have the property rights. But there's something interesting about saying that the water belongs to the future generation because when that generation gets here, it won't belong to them either, right? It still belongs to their future generation. So in, in a really deep way, it's kind of saying that it doesn't belong to anyone. It's always put off. And by putting it off, it changes that notion of belonging, I think, in a really cool way. Yeah, he's just dropping knowledge bombs up here, ain't he? <laughs> I was like, I'm going, oh, I got there. Oh, snap. No, I, I think, you, yes, that's my answer. <laughs> also, yeah, that, that word belong, it just has such a horrible history. And, and I heard somebody say, too, and I don't know where it was in some interview, that um, I belong to the land. And I thought, oh, this is another great way to start thinking in a different way. Instead of saying, this land belongs to me, to say, I belong to this land, is really to use the word belong, but to, to take it back, to take it away from, from capitalism and private property rights. Um, yeah, I, I think that it, it is. It's, it's you're reorienting yourself as an individual, but then as, as, just as a part of the greater whole of humanity, we have, that's what we need to do is reorient ourselves world to, 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 to nature um, and I think that's very inherent in Dakota or Lakota philosophy and in in how we see the world around us is in the very fact that the phrase that we usually end all our prayers with this idea of all my relations it's a recognition and, a, and a, an acknowledgement to all relatives whether human non-human plant life past or present or future it's a recognition that you are a part of that greater cycle. And that, um, you know, it's exactly what you said, that, that we, there is, there, there is, if there is any hierarchy, and it's something that we're taught, and I, I know that I grew up with, uh, being a, a part of the Chetty Shop going, is that we're the younger relatives. That all the plant life and all this, most of the animals are our older relatives. That's, that, that's our relationship to them, is that we're the younger brother and sister in the, in the hierarchy of this family of that is creation. And so, but because we have the gift of, of voice, that we have, this, that we have such a, uh, a tremendous impact, that we also have a great responsibility to protect all our older relatives. Uh, thank you. It, it just, it, it seems to me that's the kind of conversation that really is gonna make us move in a different way. Because even in, the most well-intentioned discussions of, of environmentalism it usually comes down to sustainability, for instance. It's a big word. And I know I, I get very frustrated with that because it, I, I'll, I'll use that because it has some political clout if it's gonna get something done, like reducing carbon emissions, but I don't want sustainability. 
because it means let's sustain this way of life, right? Let's try to find a way to keep doing what we're doing, essentially, but to make it last. And I think, this is horrible, what Western civilization is doing. This should not be sustained. But it's hard to have that conversation within the boundaries of the way it's set up right now. So thinking about how am I related to all of these other forms of, of not even just life, but being, is a new way to start that conversation. So it's just one of the, the successes, I'd say. Or maybe an old way. Let's, yeah, tell me more about that. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I've been talking, because I've been talking a lot about, um, hey, let's start right now at this point and start making a plan for being totally green. How do we do that? And so I've been talking to people, and we get into this sustainability thing, green bean. Um, well, one of the things that I realized is Native people are on this level. That means that I grew up in a home where we hauled our water from the river, from the Cannonball River. That means that we chopped wood, we had no electricity, we had no running water, we had an outdoor bathroom, we washed our clothes outside in a wash tub, we bathed in a wash tub. My brother was the last one to braid, so he always had dirty water. <laughs> but that's how we grew up. We grew up hunting, fishing, gathering, and we still do that. Then you get our dear environmentalists, and what I'm finding out is environmentalists are maybe four or five generations removed from living on the land. And so that, just that common sense of being a part of the land, they must think up here. Sustainable, how do we sustain this life? How do we change this life here? How do we get better here? But if you don't start down here, you're just gonna be banging your head against a brick wall because there shouldn't be a brick wall to be there to begin with. <laughs> Living on the earth starts at the ground level. And that's hard to see because I think you just see it as a, a technological problem to solve when you're up at this level. And maybe those sorts of solutions are precisely the things that got us into this mess in the first place. Us, here, meaning me, the only one on the stage that <laughs> isn't that us. <laughs> so a, a concrete example of, of an old tradition, maybe, that's very useful, is the, the crow hop. And that's something I know that you, Bobby Jean, you decided to implement as, as the run. Can you say a little something about that, how that came into being, and did you see this as part of a, a, a long tradition as well? That's a Dallas question. <laughs> That's a Dallas question. Why is it my Because you're the one that taught me about that. You're the Yeah. Well, I, 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 this is a good segue. I want to recognize Margaret, because not only you, she go, went to school here, but also she helped get some of the names, pull this together. And also, Margaret was one of the first folks as a tremendous ally working in Pine Ridge helped organize that first run to Omaha and, and helped Bobby Jean and the runners get to Omaha. And, and so from the very beginning, it was through the support of allies and solid allyship and, 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 and community organizing that we were able to pull many of these things off. So I just want to tip the non-existent hat right now to Margaret, thank you for that. Um, and other folks that had, a, uh, there's a group, uh, people over pipelines, a crew of folks that were organizing, Juanilla Locke is another relative that really laid down the line. So the Crow Hop, we were talking about how to get from point A to point B in a massive amount of miles, and you only have a certain number of people. So there was an innovative way. Well, first put this, uh, Indians like to run. This is, this is crazy. And they also like to ride horses, and like to do walks, and like every summer, our schedule's full of memorial walks, runs, and canoes, and everything, and horseback, everything. So, uh, there's this method that people do for these long distance runs, and it's called crow hop, and it's basically used, you cover long distances with a, with a small amount of people, and we were able to do that. And it was just, it's just that's how you do it. You have to make things work with what you have. And uh, that's what uh, Bobby Jean and a lot of youth did in the, in the run down to Omaha. On May 3rd, actually, it was almost, yeah, May 3rd was, uh, was the run to Omaha. And that was to the Army Corps of Engineers before they decided to give out their the, that final permit. Uh, yeah, it seems like a great example of taking something that's an old tradition 
and then putting it to use in this in this situation and, and it gets the attention of millions of people, literally millions of people because you're running. Okay. Yeah. Oh that that morning that we had just started, all the people that I asked, um, I don't know if they thought I was crazy or if they didn't want to do it, but only one girl agreed to do it with me that I asked and the others might have had um, a busy schedule or whatever and and we, we ended up not having a vehicle, so um, there's this guy, his name's John Edwards, and him and his dad came down. And it was like six o'clock in the morning, and I just had the to I just got out of the shower, I had a towel wrapped around my head, I just walked over to my neighbors, and I knocked on her bedroom door, I mean, bedroom window, and I was like, get up, you're coming with me. <laughs> and she's like, where are we going? And I was like, we're running to Omaha. <laughs> and she's like, what? I was like, I need you to be my driver. <laughs> And she was like, okay. <laughs> um, Jonathan and his dad came down and they picked us up. And on my way up there, I was just looking out the window and I was just thinking to myself, what am I getting myself into? I've never done a run like this before in my life, or let alone led one. And um, Shayla Gayton, uh, we was on her way to her house to go pick her up that morning. And we got up to Sacred Stone Camp and there was probably only about 10 people at Sacred Stone. And Weaka heard us in his, his tent. Uh, he was listening to us and um, they said a prayer for us before we started. And it was just a little, small little group. There was only four of us that started out at Sacred Stone. Me, Shayla, Weaka, and um, Jonathan. <laughs> Where Sacred Stone Camp is, you notice that it's downward hill and <laughs> me and the two boys, we like barely make it up that hill. <laughs> and we're like, what did we get ourselves into? <laughs> and we're like huffing and puffing and <laughs> you know, none of us really run on a daily or anything. <laughs> and um, we probably ran like the first five, six miles and um, the first youth girl that came, uh, she was from Little Eagle. She was about 10 years old, 11. And we, that's where we started the Crow Hop Run. And it seemed like every time we'd go through different communities throughout Standing Rock, we did 71 miles that first day. Um, it took us about 11 hours. And it was a lot of girls, girl youths that came out and ran. There were boys that came out and ran too, but it was a lot of girls. And it was all youth. Um, there were some adults with us that came out and supported some of them that ran with us too. But it was all youth, it was really awesome to see that. And just us running and being out there was really spiritual. The, like, there was these horses that were out in the pasture, they like, came all the way up to the gate and they ran with us. Um, that happened like a few times. There was this time we, we were down, we were going through Santee and there was this donkey and like right when we got in front of the donkey it just like started yapping at us all the way until we left there was this dog that ran with us for like 10-15 miles <laughs> and it would like it would like go on the side of the road and take potty breaks <laughs> and like come back and with us um throughout that whole run through omaha it rained every single day it, some days it was really windy but we we still ran through it um the last day that we got to omaha it was just a really beautiful day, pure sunshine, no clouds. It, it really, um, it really opened up our spirituality. Uh, it really showed us that Uchi Makan, Tukashua, the Creator, was really there with us. They showed us that they were literally physically there with us, through the animals, through the weather, through <coughs> the endurance of running. By the fourth or fifth day, some of us couldn't even walk. Our knees hurted so bad, but. For some reason, we were still out there and we were still running. I don't, I mean, we can't even really explain what it was, but something was out there with us. It was helping us. And it, um, the first encounter that we had of awareness, uh, this Lala, we were running through Sharon River and um, he was on his way to a dentist appointment and we were just on our last leg through Sharon River Reservation. And um, he passed us earlier in the afternoon just seeing a bunch of kids running out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, on his way back, he caught us at the end of our last leg and he stopped us and he asked um, some of our chaperones what we were doing. 
And so they explained to him why we was running and we were running for the water and the people and the future generations and just really explained to him what we're doing. And um, he got out of his vehicle, we all parked on the side of the road and he, he just thanked us. And this was an elder man and he started crying and he was just like, thank you for, for running, for doing what you're doing. Um, I'm going to a tribal council meeting tomorrow and I'm going to tell them your story about what you guys are doing and he was telling us good luck and he said a prayer for us and shook our hands and sent us on our way and that was like our first person of awareness and that night we, we got down to Laura Brule and the community was waiting for us at the gas station. We ran through the community, we said our prayers, they had a church open for us they opened up their church, they had hot food, hot and cold food waiting for us, water, coffee, juice. Um, the next morning they had breakfast cooked for us and they sent us on our way. Uh, we got to run out with the, the high school. And um, it was like that throughout different reservations throughout South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa. Um, I think a turning point for me was when we were going through Santee, and I always say this, but I'm never going to forget it. Um, when we were going through the community, there was just kids everywhere. They were playing outside, and um, we made it into town, and we started walking throughout their community, throughout their, their streets or whatever, and <clears throat> all the kids started looking at us, you know, wondering what we were doing, and we were just inviting them over, and there was just Three group of boys are just looking at us, and one boy ran over, and the other two boys looked at his friend. Then they looked at each other, and they wasn't sure. But then they ran over. Then pretty soon there was like kids from here, over here, just everywhere from the basketball court. Like there was like two year olds, three year olds walking with us, and there was probably about seventy to eighty kids out on the street just walking. And we walked to their community center, and we all stood there, and they sent us in their drum group. And it just, the, it really humbled me and it really showed me the strength that they have. It really showed me that, that they really deserve a long life to live, that they're so innocent that they don't even know what's going on. And um, it was like that through every community, seeing the way they live, seeing how their neighborhoods are. And it wasn't just indigenous communities, it was every single race out there. Just the way they live, and, you know, seeing people at grocery stores, eating groceries with their family, seeing people out to eat, seeing people going to get ice cream, and just like seeing people live their daily lives, but, you know, really realizing that they have a long life that they need to live, that we all need clean water, and that that's what it really was about, was, was clean water so we can, our generations can live forever. And, um, I really started learning a lot about my culture and, you know, really how powerful it is. Um, before that run, my, my spirituality wasn't as high as it was. And I know that, like, through the generational trauma and everything that we go through in our communities, I know that took a toll on us a lot. And seeing all those people come up to Standing Rock and Seeing all those people when we were doing the runs, just seeing their face with hope and, and open arms and, you know, really just love and everything. It really opened my heart and my mind and it, it opened a lot of people's hearts and mind. And it's really extraordinary. I'm going to just talk forever, sorry. It's <laughs> an amazing story. Yeah. Drop the mic moment. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful. Gosh. And I think it's also just a reminder of, I mean, the practice itself is a reminder that it, the destination is not necessarily the important thing, but it's how we're getting there that's important as well. So I know you're delivering a petition and, and there, there's, a, there's a teleology, there's an end goal, but it's not about how can I get to this other point as fast as possible. The running itself is meaningful. And I think that's a great metaphor for a lot of other things, not just environmental practice and, and organizing, but just life in general. Too often we, we have careers and, or we lead our lives in particular ways and 
don't really think, why is it that I'm doing this day to day? Why is this practice? We just think, well, I have to get money, or I have to have this security. Or, but life, you know, we're all headed the same place. The final goal is the same for all of us. It's not really about getting to the end of life. It's about how you get there. And the story of the run just really brings that home. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. Well, I also want to acknowledge um, the respect for water. I wasn't the founder of uh, the Standing Rock Sea Tribe was and all the, the people behind the scenes were the ones that built the website for us and stuff. And it was the Standing Rock youth that had started that. And I just want to say thank you to them. And um, also one of the young protectors that had passed away last year in the early fight that will always remember her. And the, the, the petition is still online. We have over uh, 500,000, almost 600,000 signatures now. Um, in the beginning when we delivered it to DC, it was only around 140. So I just want to say thank you to that, and the people that built the website for Respect Our Water and helping us bring our voices up to. Uh, there was a, there's two things that I, I guess I wanted, like hearing the story and, and reliving it through my mind. Like uh, I remember like when you were going, the runners going through Lower Peru, I was talking to the Lower Peru folks, and they're like, we can't find them, we don't know where they're at. They're, did they pass us already? And, um, but there was two things. One is that's just, that is this, that is a cultural form of, of organizing. And in Native communities, the act of running, put into action your intent. You know, that it's, you know, different communities have different mechanisms that work for them and for our indigenous communities. Running is a part of organizing. It's a part, it's a, it's a, it's a form of direct action unto itself. You know, same thing with memorial rides, the same thing with walks. It's, it's an issue that we, how we mobilize around is getting, just getting out and hitting the ground, literally running. Um, and that was the, the kindling, the start, start of this entire movement. And the second thing I, I wanted to just pay, take that moment and recognize, for me, I, I feel like I always wanted to really do this, is recognize the original, like, the original people of the Sacred Stone Camp. That it didn't start out with thousands of people, not whatsoever. This is a solid crew of tens of people, you know, that were there, dedicated, um, who, cameras weren't there, but they were there on the ground. They were actively you know, praying for the behalf of the water and, and resisting. You know, I, I think of uh, a good brother uh, mentioned Wiaka, you know, Wiaka Eagleman. A solid brother that was a, is a is a veteran of uh, was a veteran of the KXL fight. Joseph White Eyes is another organizer, youth organizer. Uh, there's uh, who else? Joy jo uh, Joy Braun, uh, Jocelyn, uh, Jason Charger, uh, Chris, Kaylin. There's a whole crew of names of folks that were there. And, 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 and kind of that's overlooked. And we gotta give recognition to these folks that are still resisting, they're already working with other camps, mobilizing work, and it's always weird for me because I, I'm an organizer on a national level and helping uplifting uh, in various ways, but and it sometimes overshadows the work that's being done on the ground and other folks are key individuals and in that we always have to recognize whether we know them or not, these are the true game changers. These are the true movement leaders that are, are making this world better for all of us. And I, I just really want to just recognize all those folks out there. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I'm going to want to ask another origin question, but for our last 15 minutes or so, we also want to make sure you get involved. So I'm going to ask Anna to set the microphone up. And if anybody does have a question, if you could line up behind the microphone. And while you're doing that, maybe to ask LaDonna the, the origin question here. What, what was going through your mind when you started this? When you said, I'm going to open up my property, my backyard essentially, to create this, this camp. That's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> In 2014, you know, Wash Davey Young called me to the office and told me, hey LaDonna, there's this pipeline going through. So you better look at this map. Oh my God, that's my backyard. And we go to 2016 where um, Chairman Dave Archambault was going to all the communities, telling the community that there was this pipeline, giving the education to the communities. And in that, 
that meeting at Long Soldier District, Joy Brown, Joseph White Eyes, Jocelyn, they were all there and they were talking about the 5XL pipeline. And Joy had said in that meeting, you know, does anybody want to start a camp? And nobody said anything. So at the end of the meeting, I went and seen Joy. Hi, my name's Anon. I have land. And she said, where's your land? I said, it's on Cannonball River. Can you show us? I said, sure. When? She said, tomorrow. Joy's kind of like that. <laughs> and so the next day we went down there, we showed up the area. She said, when do you want to start a camp? I was like, oh, I don't know. Joy said, okay, April 1st. So I really have to say, you know, Joy Brown is the one who said, this is when the camp was started. I had nothing. Um, and then when the April 1st came, which is the day Colonel Henderson was coming to give testimony, uh, we were giving testimony to Colonel Henderson, the camp started, I remember them setting up the teepees, and there was Joy and Joseph, and all of these people stayed the first night on the camp on top of a windy hill in the snow with no wood. I think they almost froze that first night. And so the community started coming in and bringing in things. The camp went to about 10 people to 20 people. Honor the Earth stepped in to help, and they sent people. And then Indigenous Network sent people, and so it just started expanding. I think our first from uh, April, clear until July, was training, uh, reconnaissance, finding out what was happening, talking, education. <coughs> until everything exploded in July. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what day-to-day -day life was like? I imagine it was different at different times of this. In Dallas especially, were there moments of levity, really? Because one of the things we try to do at Manny Center is say we do serious business, but serious is not the, the opposite of fun. Oh. I honestly, uh, the part that, so the, the, some of the big, the work, there was a lot of things that, you know, we. There was a lot of crap happening, like on day to day. I know LaDonna was is handling a massive amount of stuff. I always see you around with Nita, and you're, Nita, and you're all over the place, and you're dealing with stuff, and we're dealing with stuff. And, like it was just chaotic, but in such a beautiful way. And I think that one thing, when I look at all the videos now, and you look at all the documentaries that are done, and all these pieces, there's one massive part about the whole experience of the Chetty Shakoi and Sacred Stone camps that's completely like non-existent is because it was at night. Because all the cameras left. They wanted the story in the daytime. They wanted to talk to people and then they left. Oh man, the the like you think back when I think back, what makes me happy is thinking back to September in the camps at nighttime, that place came alive. There was songs, there was music, there was dancing, there was uh, every there was a delegation every different night of native, native people and there was ceremony and everything was happening at the same time and you could just stop and look and you're on top, of the, uh, on top of the hill and you look down and just see all these campfires of just people living and thriving and, and happy. And, and that was just so beautiful. And, I, and you don't see that in the stories getting caught because they packed up and left, you know? Um, and that's when I think about, oh, I wish I just like went around with the camera. I was too busy with other stuff and uh, recorded some of all the songs. Um, and there was a whole bunch of fun stuff that did. Like, man, we had some good sledding times up on the hills there. Um, you know, those are those are the, the are lots of good moments of laughter and, and just happiness. Yeah. I would have to say, you could go. One of the things nobody's really talked about is the food. You could go into the camp from Oregon, and they always have like salmon. Go over here, and they would have sheep. I'm not a sheep eater, but they had sheep, <laughs> buffalo, elk, everything you could imagine. All the traditional foods from all the different cultures that were there. And if you hit the camp right at the right time, amazing food, and everybody was sharing culture, which was song, dance, food. And you could go over here, and you could hear hip hop. You can hear traditional country, you can hear, I mean, it was just an amazing area of everything. Or, or
store, you'd also get like, the, you get food that you didn't know what was in it, but it was good. <laughs> you know, it was like hella vegan and hella like out there. You're like, I don't know what this is, but it's good. And it's hella vegan, but it's legit. It made me gassy, but it's good. Like that was there too. I remember, oh, I remember a specific memory of like, there was an evening where I was like, holy, I don't know if I can swear, but holy bleep. This is, this is something crazy unique because at that moment there was a concert. There was a concert happening down below the hill there that it was open, like, it was crazy thinking back. It was like six foot tall and it was like three foot high grass at that point. And they had set up a concert and there was Immortal Technique doing a concert over here. And then over here, there was, uh, over by the main fire, there was a crew from Alaska doing Alaska singing. Um, and then back over here, there was a crew from Northwest Pacific Northwest, the Lummi uh, delegation came in, they were singing songs. And way in the back, over where uh, Yankton Camp, back that way, Hamptawans, where there was a crew from California bird singing, all at the same time. And I was like, that's crazy. This is a crazy experience. And you don't get much of that when you watch something like CNN. We get that oh, crazy thing oh, no, just that, out there. That annoys the crap out of me. And Sarah, the, the reporter, we had um, we we had her. She came in, and we had like four different people, like actually do a tour. Like she walked with. She spent like a whole day and a half. That reporter, and I walked with her for about a good three hours and did this whole in-depth interview about all the camps, what was happening at that time. None of that was on there. None of that got any time. It was all the report back. And it was all the police slant that got covered. So that's annoying watching that because I was like, oh, I was right. I knew. <laughs> I imagine they're just, it's, it's the structure of the beast, right? It's that there's a particular agenda and it's not some sort of conspiracy thing. It's just how that, that institution works. They have a slant that they want to tell, a way that they need to tell it. That the revolution will not be televised. Yes, it will. Think about oh, that's so annoying that when she says that, <laughs> somebody completely missing the point of everything. <laughs> yeah, there was uh, there was this one night um, I went to one of the IIYC meetings and um, I just kind of took a moment for myself and I went for a walk by myself just because I wanted to enjoy the moment and I wanted to I wanted to look around and see all the people and it was. It was just so beautiful. Just people from all over the world. They just like had this calling to come here. And that's probably the most beautiful part. And it was, I don't know, it's really, your spirit really changed there. It was really good. Um, and I really like that they opened up a, a kid's school there. They opened up a, a Lakota school. It was so good in the beginning that they brought kids from Standing Rock schools there to see the camps. My niece and nephew got to go and experience that and that it really makes me feel good because it's, they got to meet all kinds of aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. You know, there are teachers now and that, that's also something that I really learned a lot. <coughs> Even um, meeting LaDonna, I learned more about um, my history. I learned where I come from. And I, I've never known that before. And it, it really feels good to belong somewhere. It really does. Um, I, feel, I feel like all of us felt like that, that we, that we belong somewhere. We belong to the land, that's what it was. And at nighttime, like he said, it was really beautiful. And you're just under a sky full of stars. Stars, really beautiful and Nobody can ever take that away from anyone that was ever there. They will never take that away. And, and I hope it keeps growing. And I certainly wouldn't want to marginalize anybody who was a part of it, but just one of the amazing things is how, how many women are involved and at the core of the movement, and young people too, which is a, a voice that usually doesn't get represented, when, especially when we're talking about politics, or, but it just, it's inspiring that that was not the case here. I, it definitely, this is an intergenerational struggle. It's a, it's a fight that really brought together all different levels of our community and society. And shout out to the International Indigenous Youth Council, IIYC. Um, much love. Because it was definitely, there was so many beautiful moments where 
leadership was fully enacted by our, our, the youth that were in camp. There was a moment, there was an action that happened and it was, there were some folks that were agitating within that action and it was the youth council um, that stepped in, just basically regulated, said, no, this is not happening this way and maintained order and pulled back, honestly, a lot of like big Indian men who were like all like being ah, ah, ah and they were like, dude, just chill out, man. Just bring, bring, you're here, bring it here, all right? Um, and, and that was it, and, that, and every step of the way, it was our sisters, our mothers, our aunties, our grandmothers who were setting the principles of everything, you know, the principles of how to organize, the principles of how to be, and um, that's such amazing leadership through that whole process. I have a question. Oh, thank you. Hi. Hey. Thank you so much, relatives, for being here today and for everything that you do. Um, just before we go really quickly, I was wondering if you had any um, advice or anything that maybe the people in this room can do today or in their lives um, to help with this struggle, not necessarily having to go to Standing Rock, but how they can, in their own personal lives and with their own money, um, help kill the black snake. I, yeah, I guess it's... Um Great question, and I think that's honestly where people, everyone's like, I want to help, how do I help? You know, I want to do something. And, and what is the narrative of, of challenging yourself and your community and your people to have a, a narrative about where they get their energy from, of, where, of recognizing the importance of clean water, and just connecting the dots that it's not just a climate, this is not just an environmental justice, climate justice move, um, uh, fight, it's also a social justice, it's a human rights issue, um, and and a big, a big, success, in my opinion, has been the divestment campaigns. This idea of recognizing that we have inherent clout as individuals, as people, um, economic clout, that we have economic power, and that we don't utilize that. And that divestment is an action of that clout, of saying, look, we're making a conscious decision to put our money in a place that we think is better for this planet. And if you're not doing that, then you're on the wrong side of history, you're on the wrong side of this fight. And whether you're a city that's doing that, or whether you're an individual that's doing that, you have a conscious decision to make. And so, so far, uh, the divestment campaign against uh, the defund DAPO, or defund pipelines campaign, we've seen over $4 billion divested out of, out of DAPO from cities. And we've seen over $80 million of personal people's money pulled out of, uh, out of DAPO. That's a huge win. That's, just, that's a conversation of us moving the money where it needs to be and really enacting our inherent power as, as individuals, uh, individuals and communities. It's not just cities, it's not just people, it's also universities. Divestment has been a critical part of organizing on, on college campuses. And so we continue to advocate for that. There's a Divest Chicago, they had an action today. Um, yeah. So you live in Chicago, you're from Chicago, engage and look at how you can help support Divest Chicago to get Chicago to divest, not only from DAPL, but divest from fossil fuel projects overall. To put themselves, put their place uh, on the right, put their position, this city on the right side of history for the benefit of, of, of this planet. Take one last question then. I don't have a question, I really have a recognition, so I'll let this guy ask you a question. Please. Yade, I'm Sosi. Also known as Huggy Bear, the Yabaha from Shetty Shakoi. You guys have all come through to speak at that on that mic, but I just wanted uh, to say, yeah, yeah, for doing what you're doing, keeping this message going. You know, um, I go out there and I speak at different places, small colleges, communities. You know, help our um, relatives, the IIYC of Chicago, and our um, Chicago, our Shy Resist, Pilsen Alliance. You know, we collaborate together to, to do this movement. We had our, our divest action at a bank right in our community of, of Pilsen. But, you know, all of us have roles and I'm very grateful that you guys are here for that. You know, spreading the message. You know, my, my message is a whole lot different than, than yours. You know, it's the same thing about camp. And when they were talking about, you know, the nightlife of camp, I used to love to go sit at the drum right there and sing sing make people feel good sing when it was really cold those nights it was cold real cold in the, in the 
the winter time. But those songs and those prayers, and because we have the youth, like my little sister there, standing there, it made you feel strong. It made me feel strong. So I just want to tell you guys, a yeah. Thank, Thank you for MC. Yeah. So I don't necessarily have a question. This is recognition to these three. Uh, Donna, Alex, she really gave everyone birth throughout, throughout, the, throughout the world. Uh, they, as far as my experience of being a runner, of Bobby Jean and uh, being at the camp, it, it was it was extraordinary. I think it, it, the thing that you, you asked the question it was what good came out of that. You know, I think it was unity. It brought a lot of people together, a lot of different people all across the world. And uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people in Indian country it, it brought them together too. For several uh, decades, they, a lot of groups, a lot of tribes haven't came together in such a, a big meeting to discuss issues within within the people and it was something big for them to do that. So a lot of history has been made throughout this journey. And uh, meeting Dallas is one of the funniest guys. It's like, you know, he's always 24-7 comedy, you know, everything he says is just, just crazy. So it's, these people here, you know, kind of gave a lot of people life throughout this movement, through this journey. And uh, it turned out hardship into uh, to something something greater, something that we understand now. Uh, as, as indigenous people and uh, people suffering across the world, you know, it, it really helped us. And I hope, I hope, I'm not saying anyone here is privileged, but I hope it helped it reach a lot of privileged people too. So, you know, we've been, we've been to a school that was, I think, $40,000 for a school semester, for a school semester in high school. And we went to that school and we spoke to those kids. The school, the students in the school put on a presentation. And, and I was so touched by how much knowledge and uh, the efforts that these kids put through to, to reach out to their classmates. And, um, and, I, and I think, you know, it's good to see this change in everyone. Because within myself and within people on the run or people at the camp, it has brought change and it has given them something to stand for. So I just want to say thank you. What will I tell you guys? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, at the Humanities Center here at DePaul, we, we celebrate the work of, of our college of liberal arts and social sciences. We celebrate philosophy and history and art and languages and all the things that we do at the humanities. But at the end of the day, this is why we do it, to, to prosper and to live a good life, and to remember what it is to live a good life together. And so it's been my privilege for the last four years to be able to give out this award. It's my honor this year to give the 2016-17 Humanities Laureate Award to the Water Protectors at Standing Rock. Thank you for joining us, and please join me. <laughs>